Hello again, friends. So welcome back to the third and final session in this series on informed consent in research studies. In the first session, I hope you have already seen, we talked about principles of medical ethics and the components of an informed consent. In the second session, we talked about the elements of review for an institutional ethics committee. And we talked about situations when informed consent is either not possible or is not needed. In this final session, <coughs> excuse me, in this final session, we are going to talk about some special situations which arise when we are either designing studies and developing informed consent documents supporting these studies, or we are reviewing proposals in as members of the institutional ethics committees. So in, in different kinds of situations, we are going to discuss eight such situations, what, what to do when we are dealing with differently able persons, when we are dealing with children and minors, when there is community research. Sometimes in research, we may need deception. Sometimes when we are handling biological samples or data, some special situations may arise in genetic testing or in genetic research. We will talk about consent in COVID situations and COVID research. And we will talk about filming and recording and the consent in those situations. So let's begin with what to do when we are dealing with differently abled persons. And these are included in studies. So a person may be blind, incapable to see, or a person may be deaf. In, in such situations, we have to design an appropriate informed consent document, which is suited to the abilities of the differently abled person. So this becomes important when you are dealing with special populations and sections of the society who are differently abled. When we are dealing with children, then if the child is less than seven years of age, then please remember a parental consent is required. If the child is seven to 12 years of age, then a verbal assent from the child in addition to the parental consent is needed. And when the child attains the age of 12 years, not only a parental consent is needed, but also a simplified version of a written assent from the participating child who is an adolescent or 12 to 18 years of age is required. So please remember, in less than seven years, parental consent, and when the child is more than 12 years old, then you need to have a simple or a written assent. In addition, supposing during the course of study, the child goes more than 18 years, that means he becomes older than 18. In this case, in this situation, he should subsequently sign the consent form. So sometimes there may be uh, situations when you're going into the community and there are a closed community settings and the community head or a community uh, chief has given a permission. In, in these situations, do we need to take permission again or consent again from individual participants? Yes, individual consent is important and is required we have to take individual consent again from individual participants. A case may be when you're going to study in a school and the school principal has agreed and you want to, part, uh, you want to include teachers or students, you have to take individual consent or assent as applicable in, in this situation from individual participants. Sometimes uh, a study may be designed which requires a deception because the moment you inform the research participant who's being observed, this may modify his behavior and may alter the results of this study. And any process of informed consent may actually lead to modification in the individual's behavior, and it may finally defeat the purpose of the entire research. If there is such a study being planned, then this should be carefully reviewed by the ethics committee before it is implemented. It is also important to incorporate a, a structure in the study where the participants and communities are debriefed 
after the completion of research. When you're handling biomaterials or biobanks or data sets, then there could be use of multiple layered consent, which could be used for future research. There are different kinds of consent which could be brought in. These could be blanket or broad consent. There could be tiered consents, there could be specific consents, there could be delayed consents, dynamic consent, a waiver of consent or a reconsent, whichever is applicable. You need to provide information about the commercial value of the data. And please remember, there has to be a statement on benefit sharing. If there are any commercial gains which are going to be achieved out of this data set or the biological material which is being developed, then what is the plan of sharing the benefit with the participants at a later stage? Sometimes when you're involved in genetic testing and genetic research, then screening, confirmatory tests, or specific investigations, or there may be pre-symptomatic testing, there could be next generation sequencing, parental or carrier testing, genomic studies or use of embryological or fetal tissue, specific consent is required you have to explain the nature and complexity, present the choices and the implications of each choice, and inform the participants about the possibilities of data sample or data storage in, in, in sub-studies. When the researcher is involved in preparing family pedigrees, the members in this pedigree become secondary participants. And it is important that when you are dealing with pedigrees, then you must obtain informed consent from every member involved in the pedigree. So last uh, couple of years, we have been struck with COVID research and, uh, and, and ethics committees are getting numerous proposals to review in an expedited manner for COVID-19 research. So please remember if informed consent is written and not possible to take it in a written format, then the consent can be done orally, but it is important to use electronic methods to document or record the process. For example, the consent may be taken on a phone call and the phone call itself may be recorded after informing the participant that the phone call is being recorded. Sometimes the participant is not attending the site and the communication can be made on phone totally. While taking the informed consent, documents and while uh, performing the procedure, it's important to maintain social distancing and to use electronic formats and researchers should be encouraged to explore innovative options for consent by using technology in interactive formats and platforms. They could use text, graphic, audio, video podcasts or interactive websites and platforms can be developed to explain information related to the study online or on in video formats in social media. Electronic methods must be reviewed and approved by the ethics committees before the study begins. And the process can be documented by audio or video recording as may be the case. We come to another interesting uh, aspect of research which includes of uh, filming and recording of individuals. The consent has to be informed. The information should include the purpose of recording, the intended audience for this recording, and the expected distribution, how it is going to be done, what are the potential benefits and harms to the individual, and what is the possibility of a breach of privacy or confidentiality. It should include a statement that this is voluntary and the participant can decline to participate, which will not affect the care or the relationship of the treating doctor and the researcher or the participant. The informed consent process should include discussion on how long the recording will be kept, where it will be kept, and when it will be destroyed. Again, the participant should have the freedom to withdraw consent at any time, and then 
he should be told that if withdrawal of consent happens or if consent is withdrawn by the participant, what will be done of the recording? The consent process uh, in, in, implies that filming will be done only after the consent process is completed. Usually it is important to restrict filming to patients who have a decision-making capacity. However, in rare circumstances, we may require to film patients who do not have decision-making capacity. In such situations, consent from parent, a legal guardian, or an authorized decision-maker is essential. Assent from a parent, in addition, to uh, the assent from an individual, a patient who is young and a child or a minor, in addition to consent which has been taken from a parent or a guardian is important. Also, it is important to remember that although assent and parental consent may have been taken, and if the child attains a stage or an age of over 18 and gets mature, then he should be allowed the opportunity to withdraw the consent for use of this recording. Please take care that the act of recording may itself alter patient behavior during clinical encounter, and this may affect the educational value of what is recorded. Please also be careful that the uh, intended use of the material is maintained and it is not used for any purpose outside the scope of the original consent document. And finally, for this session, I would like to highlight to you the Waterloo of informed consent forms. As a member of several ethics committee, it is invariably true that the most difficult part of an informed consent form is its translation into native language. Although it may appear so easy that you have to just translate it into a native language, but there are so many glitches and so many problems in translated documents that it is not even funny. Here I offer some tips on translations to researchers. Please do it yourself. Do not rely on Google Translate. Use simple words. Sometimes there will be technical words what to do when you get technical words. Instead of translating them into a native language where it may become very complicated, the same is also true for uh, when the words become too complicated after translation. Use the most widely used form of the word or the most common form of the word. It's not necessary that you need to use the authentic translated form of the word. It's not necessary. Use the most colloquial and the most easily comprehensible form. If you are in doubt, ask a friend to read the translated version of the document and see if it is effective. With this, we come to an end of this session. And this also brings a closure to the session on informed consent in medical research. Thank you for joining and uh, I hope you enjoyed listening to this presentation as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Thank you so much and wish you good luck with your research and good luck with your act of reviewing proposals as a member of the ethics committees. Thank you very much.